Uh, okay everyone, hello, my name is Duncan Forbes, I'm the director of the Photo Museum. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today because I'm with Peter Barbary, who's a curator from Philadelphia Museum of Art, and we are here to discuss the Paul Strand exhibition, which we have just installed here uh, at the Photo Museum. It's come to us from Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'm happy because I've got my cup of tea, so we're going to talk for 20 minutes or so uh, about Paul Strand and about the exhibition. So Peter, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, maybe we could talk first about this question of the acquisition of, of the archive, because you've been through a very important process at your museum of acquiring Strand's archive, but this is part of a much longer relationship between you, Paul Strand, and the Aperture, Aperture Foundation. Perhaps you could just tell us something about that. Sure. Um, well, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art organized Strand's first full retrospective um, toward the end of his life in 1968. That was organized by Michael Hoffman, who for many years was both the director of Aperture and the um, adjunct curator of photographs at my museum mm -hmm. at the PMA. So that, that exhibition happened in 1968. It traveled for many years. And at the end of the tour, Strand's widow, Hazel Strand, gave the museum the full exhibition, um, which is 600 prints. Mm -hmm. So we had, at that point, a very important collection of Strand's work. <clears throat> and Strand had established the larger archive of, of most of his surviving prints. Um, and deposited it with Aperture, um, wanting it to serve a number of purposes, but including keeping a core group of the things together mm -hmm. um, for, for study. And uh, Aperture took great care of the, the, the uh, archive for many years, but it's not a museum, it's not a collecting institution. And so the two, the two institutions, PMA and Aperture, had, had discussions at different points about the idea that the archive, um, or some core of it, would ultimately come to, to Philadelphia. And in 2010, we agreed um, to do this. Uh, we had uh, philanthropists who were willing to acquire a large core of the group for us, and then the museum made a, made a commitment to purchase uh, things. So we ended up acquiring uh, more than 3,000 works, um, representing, um, very comprehensively, representing Strand's entire life's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we completed that acquisition in 2014. So the museum now has over four, almost 4,000 prints by Strand. Can I ask you just a little bit about that 68 retrospective? Because I've seen some installation shots and it, it was a big retrospective, wasn't it? It, it was over 600 pictures. Okay. <laughs> and how was, how was it made? Was it, was it made between Strand and Hoffman? I mean, did they work together on it? Or? They worked very closely together. Okay. Um, uh, Hoffman would travel to Orcheval, France and spend uh, several weeks at a time with Strand. Um, Strand worked on the book layout um, as well as uh, the prints, and in fact, he made a great number of new prints for the exhibition, um, in part because he wanted a sort of coherency to, to the, the, the presentation of the show. And it was in Philadelphia because of Hoffman's connection to Philadelphia, it wasn't, you know... Correct. It Strand, it Strand had no uh, connections to Philadelphia, really. Okay. Um, but Hoffman had just been appointed as the adjunct curator, and, and Philadelphia very much wanted to become a uh, major... Uh, place for, for photography. Dorothy Norman, um, whom Strand had known since the 1920s, um, was a Philadelphia native and had promised her collection mm -hmm. um, to the museum and was supporting photography projects there. So it was, it was a moment when uh, a number of big museums, such as, such as the PMA, wanted to start taking photography seriously. Mm -hmm. And do you, what do you think the difference is between the 68 presentation and your current presentation? I mean, obviously Strand's not involved in your current present yes. presentation, but I'm just wondering, um, you know, both were retrospectives, I guess. In, in, in yes, um, and uh, Michael Hoffman's retrospective with Strand, of course, it was much bigger, over 600 um, pictures. Uh, and it was uh, presented thematically, roughly chronologically, but with, with minimal text, not a lot of biographical information. It really was just presenting the work. As, as direct material to be understood. Mm -hmm. um, aside from um, maybe a, a fifth of the pictures, which were vintage prints from different periods, Strand um, was worried about prints looking very different from each other. So he, he produced a lot of new prints. Often um, they were enlargements. So a slightly different aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided that we were, um, as much as possible, not only going to show vintage prints, but we were going to show prints made at every point in Strand's career. Um, of whatever subject, to really get a sense, at, uh, to, to share a sense of how important printmaking was to him, um, and to, to help the public see how his printmaking changed over time, both because of the materials he used and because of his own aesthetics or decisions he was making in the dark room. Mm -hmm. So we didn't worry too much about one picture looking like, like another or not looking like another. We, we were willing to let the prints sort of be on their own mm -hmm. uh, 
and that process of making that for me was something that was very strong about the Philadelphia presentation was that interest that you had in technique and explaining technique to visitors and I mean it come, came across very strongly in, in, in for example your use of the camera work installations and then also later on in the, when the Mexican portfolio was presented for example. Yeah. Well Strand was um, very devoted to process which isn't to say that, that he thought it was all important I mean he really the, the content of his work was what he was most focused on but he was, he was an artist who uh, spent hours alone making his prints. He really believed in the craftsmanship of any kind of artwork. And we decided it was important to, to share that side of it with, with visitors. Also because the objects are often very, very beautiful prints or books. And, um, and it's interesting to know how he made them, what, you know, what, what, he was, what he was doing. But for me, this is almost one of the, I mean, Strand is a, is a photographer for me that is full of contradictions. And I think you know one of the ways to approach Strand is to engage with and try and understand these contradictions. And one of the contradictions for me is you know he's engaged with these very 20th century media, photography and film. He's very fast moving media, but with this profound sense of craft, which is almost sort of 19th century in its feel sometimes. Um, and that seems to be one of the, one of the contradictions to Strand that's, that's most important. The other thing that comes across for me in this exhibition that's very strong is the relationship between photography and film. That's something which I think is a very important part of this presentation and that's certainly given me a lot to think about. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to go about doing that and, and, and why it is that you incorporated three of Strand's films into the show? Mm -hmm. um, well, to go back to the 1968 exhibition that we were discussing, um, one difference we really wanted to establish with this new exhibition was to um, look closely at Strand's later projects. And um, it was not going to be possible to look at all of them because he had a total of eight book projects in the last 25 years of his life. So we understood that, that to do it correctly, we really would, we would select a handful of these projects and, and, and go further in, in depth um, with them. Mm -hmm. And as I spent time with the projects, looking at them, thinking about his films, which um, photo historians and curators have tended to, not to ignore, but to spend much, much less focus on, it became clear that filmmaking was absolutely integral to Strand's later work, and it, it was just as important to him as his photography. Mm -hmm. And he really thought of them as, as two mediums that, 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 that he wanted to use um, uh, to make his work. Um, for instance, his, his work on Lutsar Italy in, in the 1950s was made um, in close collaboration with Cesare Zalatini, who is a great figure of neorealist film. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted, first of all, we simply wanted to show the films again and look at them. The films are much more political, um, much more directly political, I should say, than Strand's photographs, and I thought that was an important thing to bring out. Um, and simply to give them an airing so that people could see the, the two sides of his work together. In doing that, um, I came to a better understanding of how influential film was for him. For instance, his photo books, beginning with Time in New England, are very much influenced by his experience making films, the sequential nature of, of a film, the ability to put image and text together, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of collaboration. Strand was not very good at collaboration, but he really, um, it was an important value for him um, from filmmaking, and so he always had a writer to collaborate with on his books. Mm -hmm. Um, in all of those ways, you see film in, informing his thinking about um, his photography from the 1940s on. Mm -hmm. But of course, he engages with film quite early, I guess, in 1921 when he makes Manhattan. So, you know, it's, it's, it, the, the urge to investigate and interrogate film is, is there very early on in his, in his Yes, I mean, Strand's film Manhattan that he makes with Charles Sheeler in 1920-21 is a, an important success for him, although he and Sheeler were both frustrated with its distribution. They couldn't really control that. And then, of course, that the year after that, he became a commercial filmmaker. Mm -hmm. We don't know enough about that because, of course, much of the film has simply been lost. You know, other than the archives of universities where he filmed football games or commencements, mm -hmm. um, things just weren't saved. He did Hollywood work um, uh, that we know about. He did uh, straightforward commercial work. He would uh, film horse races in Saratoga. He filmed a sewage system in Oklahoma City. Um, so he was traveling broadly. And, and again, you know, as, as with photography um, before 1915, he had many years to sort of learn the craft, um, which really mattered to him because craftsmanship was really informed how he approached things. Mm -hmm. um, so then it's, it's not until 1933 in Mexico that he t returns to making serious film, but he had been making films in the intervening 11 years. He'd been making films every year.
Let's just probe a little bit at this, at this question of strands politics, because obviously you and your colleagues, Amanda Bock, have uh, done a lot of new research on strand. I'm just wondering whether you uncovered any new information about strand's political affiliations. I mean, for me, he's always been a kind of popular front kind of Marxist. I mean, not specifically, as far as I know, affiliated to the Communist Party, but broadly attuned to that kind of uh, popular front Marxism, which was very widely spread in artistic circles in the 30s, both in America and Europe. Uh, and then remaining fairly committed to the Soviet Union um, in the post-war period, but again without any evidence that he was an active party member or that he was very active in politics, I think particularly at the end of the late 40s. Did you, did you discover anything new about Strauss politics? Did you begin to think differently about his politics having gone through this exhibition? Um, the short answer is, is yes, I certainly started to think differently about his politics. In terms of discovering work, um, the scholar um, uh, uh, Mike, his name I'm Mike Weaver. The, the scholar Mike Weaver in the 1980s did a lot of important research on Strand's politics and actually was the first scholar to look at his FBI file. Um, Strand, as a known leftist, um, was tracked by, by the, the, the American FBI uh, beginning, uh, I think, in the late 1930s even. Um, and, and Mike Weaver uncovered um, most of that information then. And so we, we were largely building on, on the, 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 the knowledge that, that he, had, he had opened up. Um, Strand's politics are complicated. He was, he was very reticent at the end of his life about his political views. And people have always assumed um, it's because he wanted to conceal his, uh, his sympathies with communism. I assumed that when I started this project. Um, part of the research we did, and it comes out in the chronology of the exhibition catalog, was to track Strand's public statements about politics and all of his political activities. He was, in fact, quite active politically in the US from 1935 until he went to Europe in 1950. Those are the years of his most visible political activity, his greatest political activity. And time and again, he's on record for his, um, I would say, a, a, a sympathy to a broad range of leftist positions, including communist positions, to be sure. Um, and so I was confused about why he was so reticent um, later in life in the 60s and 70s when he was interviewed. At this point, um, I still don't, I'm, I'm not certain um, yet, but I think that Strand, paradoxically, uh, was worried about his art, not his politics. In other words, he felt that his politics um, should be on record and were on record and were suitable for biography, but he did not want his art conflated into his politics. And this gets back to what you said about Strand being an artist of contradictions or an artist of paradoxes. Um, he, he seems to have been more worried about the reputation of his art than, than um, the, the, the public nature of public knowledge of his politics. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that's upside down from what everybody was thinking was mm -hmm. going on with him uh, later on in life. So that's, um, that, that, that's, that's one uh, conclusion I've reached. As I said, we did, um, through, through some, some real digging, especially by Samantha Gainsbourg, uh, who worked on the show, we uncovered um, a lot of his political activity, which mostly had to do with signing petitions, writing letters to the editors of journals and newspapers, and also really actively supporting FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, and Strand was an ardent um, advocate of the New Deal, of Roosevelt's New Deal, and he wanted to support that as much as he could. Mm -hmm. He was quite disenchanted with uh, Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman, and um, moved to Europe in 1950 uh, not, I, I think not because he was feeling political pressure. There's still debate about this because Senator McCarthy, um, who would not begin his witch hunts um, in, in the U.S. for another two years. However, the Hollywood Ten, um, three of whom were personal acquaintances of Strand, um, had been brought before Congress, um, I think in 1947. So, uh, so there was political pressure against uh, communism at that time, against the left. But Strand seems to have left it at, at a moment when it, he really had the choice to do so. My guess right now is that he, he saw that um, other people, such as the Hollywood Ten, had had their passports revoked, mm -hmm. and he knew he wanted to make these projects around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he decided to leave before his passport was revoked. In fact, his passport was revoked for almost five years um, when he was in France. And he doesn't go back to the States until 59, I think, is that right? Uh, that is, I think he actually goes back in 56. Okay. Um, it may have been a three year period that, that his passport was revoked. But Hazel is traveling back and forth. Her passport never was, never was taken away. Mm -hmm. um, so so he, he moves to Europe um, 
in part because of his political views, and I think also in part because he was strategizing about how to keep making the work he wanted mm -hmm. to do. And do you think there's a kind of aesthetic form to this politics? I think Strat was interested in realism, he was interested in theories of realism, he was obviously very directly engaged with Zalatini, who had a very sophisticated conception of neorealism. Uh, Strand publishes lectures on realism in the late forces, yeah. doesn't he? So, I mean, do you think that there is a kind of aesthetic engagement with the with with, with these kind of left political activities as well? Is there is there an aesthetic Absolutely. aspect of that? There, yeah. there is. Strand is engaged with those theories. I he was not a theoretical artist, and so I I don't think he was um, directed um, by arguments, intellectual arguments or ideas. He had, uh, if you look at his most important statement about realism, which he made at the uh, Perugia Film Conference in. 47, uh, you know, he, he says realism can take on many forms. It can even be abstract, it can be puppetry or animation. He didn't have a fixed set of ideas about what constituted realism. By realism, he meant really work that engaged with the living world, the contemporary world, mm -hmm. and therefore dealt with, um, he would have said, everyday lives, mm -hmm. but that, of course, involved um, politics uh, uh, for him. Uh, Strand was always interested in populist art forms, beginning, I think, um, at least in the early 1920s with, um, with, with Manhattan. Manhattan is not a populist film, but it, it was shown in one of the big New York movie palaces, the Reopton Theater, for a week, um, where it was given a different title, New York the Magnificent, um, and it was shown with live orchestra performance, and the orchestra played these popular songs about New York from the 1890s. So not the context Strand and Schiller had, had mm -hmm. conceived for it, but um, it got great reviews, and the reviewers all talked about the songs. One reviewer said the audience almost had started to join in with a chorus. And I think Strand was, was really intrigued by, by the possibility of a mass audience for his work. And that's, that's one way that he came to what we can call broadly realism. Yeah. Um, and he, he's always pursuing a large audience for his work. He wants to make work that's very directly appealing to a broad audience that, that has a clear message. Um, he never, paradoxically, he never gets that mass audience that he's hoping for, even with his films and his books. Mm -hmm. But it's always a goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very struck by the attention to the quality of the everyday and the significance of the everyday in democratic process and democratic decision making. I mean, you can feel that in Strand's photographs. And for me, there's a really strong quality of exchange in his image making, which I think is very important. But, there's, but there is never a, a concern with the commodity. I mean, there's never a concern with popular culture as it begins to take form in the 1960s. There's a much more commodified realm of interaction, and you don't see that in Strand at all. And that's clearly not something that he's particularly engaged with or concerned with in his photography. Yeah, no, he's, um, I mean, he edits a lot out in his work. It's similar to his, his refusal to use a, a 35 millimeter camera. He had great respect for some of the work made with handheld cameras, but he was really just committed sort of in his core to the slow process of using big apparatus and, and making pictures that, you know, where the, the exposure took time, the interaction with the subject took time. I think you're absolutely right that that, that engagement on both sides, on the side of the subject and the side of the artist was very important to him. Mm -hmm. And then he would take a long time to make his prints and a long time to make his books. Um, so that, there was great thought given um, at, at every stage. And that is counter to the increasing, increasingly rapid pace of life in those decades. So I have one more question, which would be, where now for, for Paul Strand uh, studies? Where now for Paul Strand curation? What, what, what do we still have to uh, uncover? What do we still have to pursue? Well, I think given um, the turn in, in the past few decades um, by contemporary artists to photography's documentary tasks and documentary potential. Uh, there, there's a fresh reason, fresh set of reasons to look at Strand's later work. I, I really feel that Strand, in his methodical nature, did slowly over decades accrue his approaches to photography. He sort of, he keeps adding on, he doesn't discard things, so he keeps abstraction. He discovers that Jay in the, in the late, the, the early 30s, and he, that sensibility starts to inform the work. Those are just examples. But, um, you know, when he gets to the 40s and 50s and 60s, when he's making these book projects, which are not as well known as his earlier modernist works, uh, he has this, this very ambitious um, sense of what photography's purpose is in the world. Photography is a modern art form. And by that, I include film, right? And I, I think Strand made, stopped making films not because of a disenchantment with the medium by any means, simply because he, he understood his own limitations and 
So, so he, he had very ambitious ideas about what photography and film were going to do um, in the 20th century. And these, these are complicated uh, projects with, with a lot more to be said about them. So mm -hmm. one of my goals for Strength Studies is that this exhibition will alert people to the great quality and significance of his projects in New England, Lutsara, Ghana, also the, the projects in France and, and in other places. I mean, his Hebrides project is another um, very serious uh, uh, production mm -hmm. uh, that deserves attention. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, I, I guess, my, my primary goal. I also, I feel that scholarship on Strand uh, has been somewhat flat for a number of years. There hasn't been much written. A lot of it was written by an earlier generation of, of people who were invested in, in his early work, and some of it's very good writing. But I, I hope this exhibition uh, generates a lot of scholarship, often you know, from various viewpoints. Um, I'm still, as a, as a student of Strand's work, I'm, I don't feel as though I've arrived at my final assessment of things. I, I, I want to write some more myself, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that our museum will produce uh, a, a complete or comprehensive catalog of Strand's work. Um, it may be a digital production. Um, that's, that's something I'm involved in discussions about now. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we as the home for the, by far the most important collection of his work, the Philadelphia Museum wants to, to continue to, to promote his work and really just keep it visible in mm -hmm. Do you think there are surprises in the outcome still to, to pop up? Or well, there are, are reasonably well, there are individual pictures that are very beautiful. I mean, for me, one picture that surprised me, which is here on view in Winter Tour, is the photograph of the Stieglitz family buggy, a, a 1923 picture that I, I think is extraordinary. It's, it's kind of an abstract portrait of Stieglitz, um, which, which connects it to other work by Stieglitz circle artists. Um, so there are individual pictures that, that surprised me. But I, I, I think that you know, the overall scope of Strand's project is now understood, or at least it's, it's out there. Um, the challenge is to connect the later work with the earlier work. Strand always insisted that there was great continuity in his work. Mm -hmm. That's been hard for curators and scholars to see because the, the later book projects are so removed from the early abstractions. Um, but I, Strand, Strand knew himself. He knew what he was talking about, and I, I think there is continuity. There's a social eye um, all the way through the work, and there's actually also a, a very subtle attention to form and the way that form can can produce meaning, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't end with abstraction. Abstraction is just one of the tools. Mm -hmm. along the yeah, and this seems to me to be an area where, where strong scholarship could really develop. Is the, I think probably quite close formal readings of the works mm -hmm. as, as a ground for much sort of deeper interpretation. I yeah, think. I mean, as, as Strand spent hours making each individual picture, I, I think that is a great way into his yeah. work, to just, you know, look at one thing and analyze yeah, it. Yeah, because I'm not reading that at the moment. It seems to me to be a way, a way of going ahead. Peter, many thanks indeed. It's, I think the exhibition is a tremendous achievement. It looks really wonderful here in Vinter Tour. But it's been a great pleasure to install it here. Um, and thank you very much for opening Strand up again um, into the present. I think that's a, a really wonderful thing to do. Thanks very much. Thank you.